Hey guys, um, one of the things that I get questions about a lot when talking to art ministry facilitators, they've done the training, maybe you've, you've read a bunch of books, and now you're going, what on earth do I do now? What's the next step? And while getting started and getting trained or basically that gathering of information stage is so, so, so important. But if we don't do anything with that information or the things that we've learned, then it begins to just sit there and it sits stale. Life happens and there are reasons why we can't begin to, you know, to do things that we want to do. However, I really want to encourage you that if you have been in a place that's kind of like a stalemate where you're in that call it the doldrums, the wind isn't blowing and you're going, I just, I don't have any direction. I'm not sure where to take this. I have a desire. Um, I have the, the training, but I just am not sure what happens now. The resource that I developed when created is uh, called a stewardship assessment. And stewardship, it's just the careful management of something that's entrusted to your care. So stewarding something means that God has given you things each one of us. God's given us things that we hold in our hands. And how do we take what we're holding in our hands and do a really good job of taking care of it? The beginning of understanding what we do next starts with stewardship. So I want to encourage you to do this worksheet, to do some of this brainstorming. I'm going to walk you through it. And that hopefully will help launch you into that what comes next stage. So go ahead and you can print out, you'll find it as a PDF, or you can even just do this. If you, if you can't print something out, you can look at it online and then you can just use a blank sheet of paper. But um, the, you're gonna have a chart that has three different columns. Are gonna, we're gonna walk through each one of these sections together. And then like I said, hopefully, you'll have a little bit better idea of how to take that one next step in faith. I want to start off by reading a story that comes out of John 6. I love this story. You've probably heard it before. It's about Jesus, the disciples, and multiplication. So if you'll join me, Jesus is coming and is recognizing there's a lot of crowds there. So there's just tons of people, tons of need. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for to eat, for all these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. He already had in mind what he was going to do, which did you catch that by the way? I love that. Jesus asks us questions sometimes to invite us to creatively brainstorm and figure out there's a problem here. What are we going to do about this? He invites us into that process, so that's what we're doing right now. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. So Philip is immediately saying, That's too much need. I don't see how that's possible, what you're asking. Although maybe he didn't exactly know what Jesus was asking. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish, but how far will that go among so many? So Andrew's seeing something different. He looks around, he takes an assessment and says, what's here? There's a boy, he has a lunch, but it's too small. So many times when we stop and we look at even what we have, it seems like it's not enough, doesn't it? You might be thinking right now of the things that you have in your hand and going, it's not enough to meet the need. It's not enough to do the job. <laughs> I love this next part. So he just said, how far will they, will this go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. I love that. I love it. Jesus is like, just watch. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down, about 5,000 men, meaning there's a lot more women and children too. Jesus then took the loaves, he gave thanks, he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, there was enough. I'm going to 
Remember, Jesus said he already knew what he was going to do. He said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Do you hear that? He doesn't want anything to be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. After they saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Certainly this is the prophet who has come into the world. I love this story for multiple different reasons. First of all, the little boy was just showing up. He just wanted to see Jesus. He showed up with what he had. What do you have right now? That's what we're going to take a look at. What are you coming with? When Andrew was looking around, first of all, the other disciples, Jesus said, I want you to feed these people. And so many times we look around and we see all the needs and we feel inadequate. And we think, Jesus, what are you asking me to do? This seems impossible. There's not enough of what we have to meet the needs that we're seeing right now. It's overwhelming if you stop and think about the brokenness and the pain, the hatred, the discouragement, the poverty of so many people, not just around the world, but in our own homes, in our streets, at the edge of our cities. There's too much. And like the disciples, we sit and go, God, I don't, I don't see how you're going to meet all of these needs. Even if you want me to meet these needs, we don't have enough to do it. So let's be like Andrew, right? That looks and stops and says, okay, okay, well, what do we have? But before we do that, I love that Jesus allowed his disciples to be a little bit uncomfortable. And that's what we're gonna do right now. So in our first uh, assessment, we're gonna start with a column and this is a needs poll. And this time I want you to just, you're gonna pause it and I want you to write down needs that you see. This will be overwhelming, but I really want you to stop and take a look and think about what are some of the physical needs you see around you. Start with your own home and then work your way out. I don't want you to go right now further than your city, but start in your home, then go to your street, then go to the streets around you, and then think about the outskirts of your town. If the Lord takes you further than that, that's okay. But I want you to think about the physical needs. What are some of the physical needs that you're seeing with your eyes around you? What are some of the mental and emotional needs? There's stress, discouragement, weariness, oppression. What are some of the, and, and list them specifically. So if there is um, a, a intense food shortage or food crisis on your, in your city and in your streets, write that specifically. If there's depression that you feel like it's just clouded where you're at, I want you to write that down specifically. So take time and in this space, if you need more space, write down the different needs that you're seeing because that's what Jesus, again, allowed his disciples to see the intense need. He didn't just look to the other side. He didn't immediately answer all of their problems. He allowed them to sit in that uncomfortable. We should feed them. What should we do? I want you to feed them. And that feeling of, uh, I can't, I can't, Lord. It's okay. Jesus invites us into that. So pause it here. Take a moment, turn on some music, pray first, and ask God to show you what are the needs that you need to have in this city, Jesus. That's a lot, isn't it? It feels like it's too much. And it could be that you just wrote down a few, a few things, but even if you just look within your own home, it can be really overwhelming. So this next part is so beautiful. And this is, as we look at this story and we break down the story of loaves and fishes and multiplication, we, we begin to see this pattern that Jesus is creating for us. So we're gonna take this next time to do a resource poll. You'll find that in the middle section, or if you're just using a piece of paper, it's gonna be right here in the middle. And this blows me away every time I really stop and think about, God, what are the resources that I have access to? Not everyone, but you specifically. God has given you access and proximity to things that other people don't have. 
you might think, no, 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 not me. I, I don't, I don't even know what I have. I don't know if I have skill, ability. I don't know who I have connection to. You have more than you realize. And the truth is Jesus takes those loaves and fishes that feels like I don't really have that much and he multiplies it. So rather than looking like Philip said and goes, it would take a year's wages. It's not enough. We're going to look at what we do have where Andrew said, well, here's a boy with loaves and fishes. Even though he doubted at the end, the fact that he said, here's someone with some, some bread and some fish means he saw the possibilities and what Jesus could do. He just wasn't sure about it. Jesus takes the smallest bit of faith that we have and he multiplies it to do things that we could never think or imagine possible. So where it says resource pool, we have physical resources. That means what do you physically have? It could be, I, I have land that I have an art studio on. It could be financial resources. It could be that you, somebody donated a ton of art supplies to you. Um, maybe you have access relationally or you have um, access to, to people in the government. Maybe you have access to different pastors ears. So think about maybe it's not your own personal resources. Maybe you have access to resources. Um, capacity. That just means uh, the, the amount of energy or time you have. Maybe you have after hours that you have available. Maybe you have um, downtime when someone's napping at your house. So whatever that is, what capacity do you have as a resource? Um, what skills, knowledge, and abilities do you have? That can include things like training that you just did. Um, it can include the things that just come naturally to you, things that you love doing where you stop and think, you know, I learned how to, uh, I learned how to weld a long time ago. I, I don't know how that can be used, but I'm going to write it down. Um, so it can be anything. This list should be longer than you can think because you are amazing. And God has gifted you with a lot more than you realize that he's gifted you with. The last part of this resource pool is just desires and interests. Our desires are actually a resource. That's, that's something that if I hate doing something, that's not a great resource that I have. Um, so think about the things that you, you really just are interested in. It's a, it's a actual resource to have someone that's interested. If there's, youth ministry and you have zero desire to work with youth, you don't want that person as a volunteer. But if you might have no idea how to work with teenagers, but if you have a desire to work with them, that is a resource. So make sure you list those too. So again, stop for a moment, take as long as you want to, to look around you, think about being in that crowd, picture yourself sitting in this crowd, you're seeing all this need and you're looking at what is in your basket. What's in there, Jesus? Show me. Well, I, I've got this. Let's see what he does with that. So we're going to take Jesus' lead here. And if you're done writing all these resources, I just look at it. Look down for a second and think about how amazing it is that God has Put those things in your hands to take care of. No one else's. He's put them in your hands because he trusts you. So we want to be good stewards. But do you know what Jesus did whenever he was given those, those fish? Which, first of all, we don't... I'd love to just hear that little boy's version of the story. of If he just handed it, it was like, okay, here you go. It's kind of what it feels like sometimes. But Jesus immediately, it says... He gave thanks. He took the loaves and then he gave thanks before he distributed. So before the miracles even happened, he stopped and he thanked God. So that's what we're going to do because that's what Jesus did is he gave thanks. So pause it here. And I just want you to turn on some, some worship music you to, or maybe sit in silence. And I just want you to thank him. Maybe it's going through and, and individually thanking him for each one of those things. If you want to sketch, if you want to draw a basket, draw some of those things in a basket and just thank him. Get creative with it or don't, <laughs> but spend time thanking him for what he has allowed you. 
because he's allowed you to for what he has allowed you to hold in your hands. And as long as you need to do that, thank him, praise him, celebrate it. And then we're going to come back and begin to put these pieces together. This very last section here that says, I just want you to write down the things that, that you really enjoy, the things that you love to do. Um, it doesn't have to do with creativity. It doesn't have to do with ministry, just anything that you enjoy doing. And then also I wanna make sure that you're asking the question, are there things that you really wanna see God do? So those passion things can also be things that you're like, I really want to see people healed of depression around me. It's a, it's a need I'm seeing and I, I want to see that. It could be really specific where you go ahead and incorporate um, your creativity into it. That's fine. Uh, but Jesus says, uh, or in Psalms 37, um, the, the Godhead, uh, we know that it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So in our heart, we've just spent time thanking him and praising him delighting in him or thanking him those desires he connects those places where our our heart desires and the needs of the world and the things he's put in our hands that's where we're going to start to see those intersections so take a moment write down the things you care about hey there so we have a page that's filled with a lot of information. Maybe not so much, but, but for some of you, maybe a lot of information. And this might, again, feel a little bit overwhelming, but I'm reminding you again that Jesus was okay with the disciples feeling a little bit, a little bit overwhelmed because he's the one that actually makes the miraculous happen. We just get to be part of it. So again, we're going to take this space now where, where there, we see needs, thinking specifically about the needs in our own communities, okay? The resources that we have access to or have been given and the things we really care about. And that's where we're gonna begin to see where we connect the dots. But I wanna go back for just a second. It's also really important that we follow instructions and directions. I don't know if you caught it, but in that passage of scripture where the disciples are gathered together, there are multiple things that Jesus actually tells his disciples to do. He says to gather the people, to have them take a seat, distribute the baskets. He first tells them, I want you to feed the people. So if you haven't already done this, it's really important to stop and ask the Lord, Jesus, is there anything that I've missed? Any instructions that you've told me to do that I haven't done? and begin there. So before you do anything else, before we connect the dots or anything else, I want you to ask the Lord, God, is there any instructions that I've ignored thinking, uh, I'll do that later. It could be contacting a, a friend to maybe do a one-on-one -on -one session. Maybe it's reaching out to a local pastor or community leader. Maybe it's um, putting something out there and setting a date. So if there's something right now that you know Jesus has already put on your heart to do. And again, it doesn't always sound like an audible, go do this. Sometimes it's just that idea or that nagging feeling that keeps coming up every time we pray or think about ministry or creativity. You might go, oh yeah, there's, there's that thing. Do that, start there, follow his instructions first. Because if he's told you to do something and you're not doing it, we might not see the miracles happen. Obey him. But if you've obeyed up until this point, you feel like I just, I'm not hearing anything else. I, I don't, I don't know what else to do. There's no more instructions available. That's where we get to use these resources and begin to connect the dots. So I'm going to give you a couple of different ideas. And we have a goal here. We have a goal of finding one thing, not lots of different things, one thing in each one of the areas that can connect together. So for example, um, and actually I want you to start in a really specific place. So we're gonna look at this passion hole part um, and where it says things that you wanna see God do. We're gonna go to that section down there and I want you to circle one of those things. Maybe, maybe it's just one thing. 
I want you to circle one thing, highlight it, however you want to do that, but put your finger on it. One thing, really just focus on that. And I want you to go over to this needs and I want you to look over the needs, and I want you to put your finger on, okay, so scroll down it. I want you to put your finger on if there's a need that you're seeing in your community that that would meet. So for example, if I really want to see, um, uh, if there's a lot of depression, I really wanna see people freed up from that depression, okay? And I'm seeing a need for people to be freed from depression. That is, a, that's a really obvious one. But if maybe, maybe your passion is, I wanna use the arts to see um, uh, people have hope, okay? And we're looking down here and we have a, a need that you see of, well, I, I see that families are, a lot of families around me are maybe breaking up or getting divorced. Those might not immediately connect for you, right? But do you see how, oh, okay, maybe there's a lot of people around me that are experiencing pain and brokenness in their, in their homes and I wanna see hope. So maybe that's the need we need to focus on. Does that make sense? So you're gonna think about something you wanna see God do, generic or specific, look at some of these needs and figure out what need connects with that passion. And once you do that, and, and I would maybe even suggest, um, there's another page here that says notes and Thanksgiving. Um, this is also where you can write some of the things you're thankful for. Um, but in those notes, you might wanna begin to brainstorm on a new sheet of paper here. Part of it is when you're going to look at the resources and think, okay, I've taken something that I want to see happen, something I'm passionate about, because you have to have passion or else you're going to die out. You're going to get weary and tired and not want to keep doing it. So that's why we start with the passion part, because even if there's intense need, but you don't, but you don't care about it, you're not going to keep doing it. So begin with the passion. Think about what do I care about? Mind you, this changes. Passion changes. Hear me? You might need to revisit this. There are different times and created in the ministry that I run that my passion has changed. So I have to revisit and reassess what I'm stewarding and what I'm spending time doing. That's okay. So we're starting with what you really care about. We're connecting it to actual needs that you see and asking God to show you, does this actually meet a need in my community, in our home, in our city? And then looking at your resources going, what do I have access to right now, today? Not tomorrow, not the next day, but what in this exact moment, what do I have access to and holding in my hands? Like I brought my lunch to the table that you can use Jesus to meet these needs. And I promise you, there is something. You might not have it all spelled out, but there's something. There's a place where you can begin, where as you're brainstorming and you're, and you're looking at all of these like different possibilities, again, it can feel overwhelming. But I wanna read you a quote by Martin Luther King Jr. It says, take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. And I love that. I love that quote. So many, I mean, that's what faith is, right? We're just obeying that one small step doing that one thing that comes next. And a lot of times when we begin to connect the dots, there's an action step. So if you find that you connect the dots and go, oh, I can um, paint watercolor cards um, for patients that have are in the hospital that are experiencing pain, and I can call my friend and maybe she wants to come watercolor with me. There's so many action steps in that. So we're not, you don't have to develop this whole ministry. You don't have to have a whole action plan. You don't have to see the whole staircase, right? We're just doing one thing and allowing it to develop, to develop into the next thing and into the next thing. And I am so excited to see how he takes your loaves and your fishes that you offer before him, because that's what you got, and multiplies it to feed so many people you might never know, people you might never see. And let me also encourage you that multiplication doesn't just mean like reaching the needs of a lot of people. It could mean having just deep eternal impact that lasts for generations because you pour into one person. 
So multiplication doesn't just mean of people. It can mean of the impact that that healing can have to the next generation and the next generation. So don't be discouraged if you're like, I don't wanna think big. Jesus thinks big enough for all of us. You just obey, you take a step of faith. I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you. Don't get stuck, do one tiny thing today that's moving towards that place where you're both obeying Jesus and getting excited along with him and saying, this is what I got, let's see what you got, Jesus. And I have a funny feeling he's getting ready to look at you and say, Tell the people to sit down.